Welcome back. This is Eric, Program Coordinator for Spurs. With me, as always, is Ashley. Hi. Today we're talking about the third, but not the least important, last but not least, uh, the third and final appeal, the appeal to logos, the appeal to reason. Sometimes people call it the appeal to fact. Um, we want to talk a little bit about why appeal to fact is, is not quite the right way to think about logos, although it certainly is not an inaccurate way to think about it, because logos is more than just dates and statistics and numbers. Logos has to do with the way an argument's put together. We call it sometimes the chain of reasoning. So if you think about a chain, and each link on the chain is one idea, and you know the way that the chains fit together makes the entire argument. So you can see if you've ever seen a weak chain, and you tug, and they fall apart, right? And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about analyzing logos. We're talking about do all the parts fit together? Do they fit together in a way that's logical, in a way that makes sense? And I think we want to start with the assumption that essays are trying to make sense, that arguments are trying to make sense. So we're going to be kind to people, give them the benefit of the doubt, that they're trying to make good arguments, the best arguments that they can make, and that they put everything in an order that they think makes the most sense, so they can try to be understood. Yeah, I think um, that chain image is a really helpful tool for understanding logos. Um, I oftentimes, if I have very visual learners in my class, I have them just draw a series of boxes, two or three boxes, um, and input that information and say, okay, if the audience believes this thing, maybe that's a statistic, maybe it's not, then they should come to this conclusion. And that it's that process of joining information together, of moving the reader from one premise to another to a conclusion, that's what we call logos. It's not simply, oh, there's a statistic here, that's logos. It's the way that statistic fits into the rest of the argument. That whole thing is logical reasoning. Yeah, that's a good explanation, right? So again, we're talking about each of these different elements in the essay, when put together, they form an argument. And they should fit together the way that each link on a chain fits together. None are too big or too small to make the chain. It's consistent. And that's really what we're going to try to do, is we're going to assume that these arguments are trying to be internally consistent, that they're doing everything they can to be logical, right? And it's not our responsibility now to evaluate whether or not they're doing that. But if you're reading an argument, and you notice that one of the chains doesn't fit, or the chains fall apart if you pull on them, right? Then you're looking at a flawed argument. But for now, or as a default, we're always going to assume that they're trying to make internally consistent arguments, and it's our responsibility as rhetorical analysts to try to explain that consistency. If we can't explain it, and we've tried our best, then we're probably looking at a flawed argument. And certainly when you all make your arguments in the synthesis essay in Unit 3, you want to make sure that you aren't making a flawed argument. You need to make sure that you have a chain of logical reasoning that you know, offers a firm progression of um, premise to premise to conclusion. Absolutely. So like we said, logos is, of course, the appeal to facts. But it's not just the appeal to facts. So let's talk a little bit about why that is the case. We're going to step out of frame and turn on another article. This is, I believe, article or source number six in your reading packet. It's the Mark Kerkorian essay, and we're going to look at paragraph two. So if you're looking at Kerkorian's essay, paragraph two, you'll see that he comes to the conclusion that, on average, each illegal immigrant who attends a public institution will receive a tuition subsidy for tax of nearly $6,000 for each year he or she attends for a total cost of $6.2 billion a year. Okay? $6.2 billion a year is logos. It is a statistic. It is a number, a fact, a figure. It looks like a lot of money. So we assume that Krikorian's argument here is that we're spending too much money. Because six billion dollars, I think, by most people's estimates, is a lot of money. But you have to put these facts, these figures, in context, right? Because Kokorian dropped it in here, but there's generally more stories, right? So, for instance, I did about a two-minute Google search, and I found that each year the United States spends on average three hundred and seventy-three billion dollars on higher education. Three hundred and seventy-three billion dollars. If you do a quick little math, what you find is that $6.2 billion 
is about 1.6% of 373 billion. So if you look at the total amount that we spend, we're actually spending a very small amount of it on paying for students who are the children of legal immigrants to attend higher education institutions, right? So we have to think, because again, our responsibility here is to make Krikorian's arguments internally consistent. Our responsibility here is not to just try to find flaws in his argument. We have to try to go back and say, like, well, why would he say this then, right? Why would he use $6.2 billion and give the assumption that that's a lot of money? Well, one, maybe he, he, wanted, maybe he thinks that's a lot of money. Maybe he thinks even 1% uh, of the total budget is way too much to spend on this issue, right? Maybe he thinks that one cent is way too much to spend on this issue because, since you read the rest of this argument, you know, a lot of it's about the fact that the federal government is making state governments spend money. So it's the concept of federal government mandating spending by the states that upsets Krikorian, right? He may also not like the price tag of $6.2 billion, but it seems to me his larger argument is that the federal government shouldn't force the state to spend money, even if it's one cent, even if it's $6 billion, even if it's just 1% of the total budget, okay? So in this way, and I think we can turn on the lights and, 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 and move forward here, but I think in this way we see how facts have value Facts are clear, but facts, when used in arguments, probably there's more to it than that. So let's look at one more example. I'm zooming up to the Arnie Duncan article. If you have your packet with you, I you think this is sor source number two. We've talked about this yes. in previous videos. Hi. So this so is the Arnie Duncan article. Um, so very quickly, so Ashley talked about premise. She said, "What are the premise?" Let's talk a little bit about what a premise is and give you an example of that. So um, something I find really helpful about this article is Eric was just showing you a great example, um, zooming in on how statistics can function as a larger logical appeal. Um, you've already learned about pathos. Well, pathos can actually function as a part of a logical appeal. Um, and here's how. If you look at um, this sentence here, we have Arnie Duncan again arguing that we should have the DREAM Act because it helps these students who need help and deserve help. Um, Arnie Duncan starts this logical argument by tapping into a value shared by his audience. Um, he says, they are valedictorians, star athletes, community leaders, and are active in their faith. He presents this information about DREAM Act candidates. What he doesn't say, and what we can assume is a shared value, is that Arnie Duncan and his audience all think that athletes and valedictorians and community leaders are great, that we should have more of them, that they're admirable, that we should help them. That's not stated here, but it's implied. It's a value that you can see underpinning this argument. So in my mind, that's step one. That's the first box of, of logos, the first premise we need to agree on if we're going to follow this argument. The second premise then is, OK, valedictorians and star athletes are great. Here he's giving us the next premise, Dream Act recipients are valedictorians and star athletes. From those two premises, the logical conclusion is, well, if we think they're great and these, these Dream Act recipients are these great people, obviously the conclusion we should help them. And that's how Duncan is using pathos to make a logical argument. So again, the premise is often an unstated but essential part of the argument that rhetoricians, speakers, writers, filmmakers use or rely on in order to make their point. So we see this with Duncan, right? He doesn't come out and say that communities love good students, right? But he relies on us knowing that most communities love good students in order to make his argument, right? So that when he says, look, there are children of illegal immigrants who actually are really good students, and if the community likes good students, then you have to like all good students. Now we see how a chain of reasoning is being constructed, right? Or moving from box to box, as, as Ashley um, suggests. So it is important to remember these beliefs and values your audience has. It's so important to revisit those and to ask yourself what they are even when thinking about logos, which is something that you might think of as very logical, um, but they can weave into those logical chains.
It's a great point. It's a great point, and I think it really sort of ties up all these appeals for us. We started with ethos, the appeal to credibility, and we moved to pathos, the appeal to uh, emotions or beliefs and values, and then we ended up with logos, the appeal to reasoning, right? Not just facts, but reasoning, and the reason we say it's not just facts, but also reasoning, is because we think ethos and pathos are in some ways subsets of logos, right? That you have to look and say, is the pathos being used in logical ways? Does it make sense for it to, to exist here? Is the ethos being constructed in logical ways? Does it make sense for it to exist here? And, and that's a perfect example, right? Of, uh, Duncan's example is a perfect example of that in action. So logos, it's complicated because in some ways it deals with the other appeals, even though it's got its own thing going on with facts and figures. Uh, but I think if you think about it like that, writing a rhetorical analysis essay is going to make more sense. Because again, remember, really what you're doing is describing the way these three appeals relate to one another, how they work together to form one coherent argument. You're ready to write your papers. Great. Good luck to you. Take care. And again, if you have questions, ask your teachers, ask your partner instructors, and you can always contact me. Take care.